Are we live? All right, so we got Kathy here. Is Steve with you? This is still very annoying to me that I can't, I, I'm having to put up on my phone, oops, me, uh, because it is the only way that I can see how many people are actually watching. So, um, this looks crooked to me. It's going to drive me insane. Let's see. Hmm. Let's try to go ahead. that way. Oh. 
To be in person where things don't look crooked all the time. be good enough, I guess. Oh, well. Huh? Oh, we got a few people. Thank you for commenting. Keep commenting. Makes it all better. And go Lobos. Um, by the way, if you don't know, I, think I, I don't think I've taught all of you guys this yet. So the, the Lobo uh, thing to do, I guess, I don't know what to call it. Uh, but what you do is you, you go like this, makes a little like wolf, here's the ears, here's the mouth, and the, the chant is always when you're at like the basketball games and stuff is, everyone's a little bow, woof, woof, woof. So now you know, it's important things that we learn here. Um, let's get started with a word of prayer and we'll get going and see what we talk about today. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, just real quick, everybody can hear me okay? Is that correct? Um, let me know if you can't hear me very well, and I will see if there's something that I can do about that. I'm not sure that there will be. Um, thank you, dear. All right, so today, as you know, is Palm Sunday, but it is also known as this, uh, uh, Sunday of the Passion. Um, and so, so maybe we'll start with this. Uh, can anybody that's watching, other than Michelle, because I just told her this morning, uh, what, why do we call it um, the Sunday of the Passion or the passion of Christ. Why passion? See if anybody knows the answer that other than Michelle. Michelle can't answer because I already told her. And no, no Googling answers either. That's cheating. We got nothing. We're less than like five minutes into this and I've stumped everybody already. I mean, isn't this a weird thing though? We talk about the passion of Christ. We've probably seen the movie, The Passion of Christ, and yet we have no idea why we call it the passion of Christ. Uh, no, <laughs> sort of. Um, it, I, so, 
Kathy, you are on the right track. Or maybe it was Cliff. Who knows? Uh, one of you. One of you Heineggers. Or is, is you're on the right track, but you're you're a, you're a step beyond. <clears throat> So, um, the, the reason is, and, and you know, you guys are probably going to get tired of this with me, but um, the, the reason is because it's coming out of Latin. As Latin or Greek, as so many of these things do, um, it's, it's coming out of Latin. So Latin is... Passionum, I believe that's right. There's any of my friends that are Latinists that are out there watching this. Well, the one guy I know for sure that's a Latinist isn't on Facebook, so he can't tell me I'm wrong. But if I remember correctly, this is the word is passionum, and in Latin, passionum means. Suffering. <laughs> One of those great times where the, the word has completely changed what it means now, right? So um, we think passion and we think, like uh, Kathy mentioned, we think caring, love, these sort of things. We think um, an emotion. So we think passion and we think emotion. And that's not what what it means uh in fact to be so, so but this is where we get the idea of being passionate about something if you are passionate about something in the classical use of the word that would mean that you care so much about the thing that you are willing to suffer for that thing now this makes a lot more sense why we call it the passion of christ because it is the events um in which our lord is showing his care, his love for us in that he loves us so much that he's willing to suffer for us, right? That is his, he's passionate about us, right? So, so that's what, why we call it the passion. Um, now, the other thing, write this down. Uh, the other thing is we get into this. Um, so typically, um, when we talk about the passion of Christ, we're talking in one of two ways. I, I've seen this kind of in both ways. We're talking either about starting with the night of his betrayal, Monday, Thursday, through um, Holy Saturday, his, his burial and, and rest in the tomb. So we're either talking about that or we're talking about the entire week. So we talk about Passion Week or Holy Week, um, where we're walking through this, this time with Jesus. Um, this is, and I think that the, the, the latter one, starting with Palm Sunday and moving forward, is probably the better way to think about this, because this is where this whole deal of Jesus setting his face on Jerusalem. Now he's in Jerusalem and he's doing all these things that are directly tied to his, uh, to his suffering for our sake. Now, this is the really incredible thing. Uh, see if we can sketch this on the board a little bit. When it comes to the Gospels, um, and, and while I'm doing this, Tell me what color shows up best for you guys. Um, blue, red, black, what? What color shows up best for you guys? And remember, if you've got a question, ask the question. I'll see it in the comments and I can respond. Uh, but do, do interact uh, as, as much as you can on your side, okay? Um, when, when we're 
reading through the Gospels, one of the things that's really incredible, but we, we miss it all the time, is how much of the Gospels, and all of them, percentage-wise, is taken up for this week. Um, and it will, we should say particularly from Palm Sunday on, because, you know, you're going to have, like, Matthew concludes with the Ascension, right? That's 40 days after Easter. So, um, uh, but, but how much of that, how much of the Gospels um, are concerned with just that very end part? So, we've got Matthew, we've got Mark, we've got Luke, we've got John, right? I told you guys I love my charts. I think charts are helpful. Um, Matthew has um, so if we do this, this right here is going to be the um, the total number of chapters in each book, right? So Matthew has twenty-eight. Mark has 16, Luke has 24, John has 21, right? And they're generally, even though the chapters aren't original, the chapters are generally about the same size overall, so it does give you a, a good feel for the overall length. Matthew and Luke are going to be the longest, John's next, and, and Mark's the shortest, right? But it's also helpful to see what percentage of the gospel is being taken up by this stuff. So now here's the question: If we're if we're going into um, uh, Palm Sunday, um, what chapter in each book? does Palm Sunday start in? And this would be a good time. If you don't have one already open, grab a Bible, open it up, because we're going to be taking a look at the accounts um, uh, this afternoon. So what chapter in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does Palm Sunday start? And, it, it, and when you realize this and how much space is left in the gospel, it is pretty incredible how much time is spent in uh, in Holy Week. Um, and then we'll say Palm Sunday and then burial is going to be here. And then the rest is the resurrection and ascension narratives. So, what do we got? Any, any takers? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Ringo. It was always one of my favorite jokes in Sister Act was who are the um, who are the apostles and she goes up and she lists off the Beatles, right? Um Matthew 21, yeah, so that's, Math so that's Matthew. I guess I don't need the... Um, 
Mark's going to be 11. No, nope, most of you are probably looking up Mark right now, and I just got you. Uh, Luke is 19. John is the one that's really phenomenal, because John starts all of this in chapter 12. <laughs> Uh, which is just incredible. I mean, almost half of the Gospel of John is um, uh, Palm Sunday and on, right? Now, where do they stop? Like, that, that's, that's the other question. Um, where do all these stop? So, um, the, the burial is going to be, in Matthew, it's going to be chapter 27. In Mark, it's chapter 15. We'll do this, resurrection. Resurrection and ascension is going to be Matthew 28. This is going to be Mark 16. Uh, this is going to be 23. Resurrection accounts are in ch chapter 24. This is going to be 19. 20 through 21 is uh, the ascension. Um, So I don't know how much of a delay there is between me talking and you guys hearing what I'm saying. So, um, I don't know. That that might be part of this too. There, there's probably a little bit of a delay here. Uh, but look at this, right? So this helps us see. So you've got uh, seven chapters of the 28 in Matthew that are dealing with Palm Sunday, dealing with Holy Week. You've got five of the 16, it's basically a third of uh, Mark dealing with it. You've got four in Luke, so that's probably uh, for as far as um, uh, space, that's the least amount, but it's still a pretty good chunk for one week, like one week out of 33 years. And then John, John has seven of his 21 chapters, right at, right at a third, are dealing with this. But it starts so early, right? And so we should remember, like I said, that this space right here is one, one week One week out of 33 years. <laughs> and then these, right? These right here, the resurrection and ascension, that this is going to be, uh, like I said, this is going to be 40 days, right? So the whole thing... Um, You've got just over, yeah, like six and a half weeks worth of stuff here on, right? So the evangelists will cover the first um, 33 years, sort of, right? So we remember if we look back at the beginning um, of the evangelists, that you don't have a lot of time being spent on the birth, right? Uh, Luke definitely spends the most amount of time on this. Uh, the, the the birth narratives and everything in the in the early years, but we get to um, Jesus is presented in the temple. He's circumcised on the on the uh, eighth day. He's presented on the fortieth day, um, and then there's a jump ahead. At least in Luke, you have Jesus as the young boy in the temple, um, and then there's another jump. And so the majority of the gospels. 
or the the this this space in between is dealing with uh, the three years in which Jesus is performing his earthly ministry from baptism on. Um, so if we insert that, let's see. Where the baptism shows up, Matthew, that's chapter three, Mark, uh, that's chapter one, Luke, that's I'm going to say three, but that's not right. Hold on. Oh, that's right. Luke doesn't have the baptism account. No, it is three. Yeah. It is three. Three. And John um, doesn't, doesn't really have it, uh, but we... We'll do this. It's one. John the Baptist is in chapter one, right? So the they they spend almost no time. Luke and Matthew spend the most, but none of them really spend a whole lot of time on um, Jesus as a child, right? This period right here. So three to twenty. 1 to 10, 3 to 18, and 1 to 11. These are going to be the three years of ministry. Uh, teaching, preaching, performing miracles, all this sort of stuff. What's the title for the third row? Uh, so chapter, baptism, uh, Palm Sunday, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm working on figuring out how to get this to show up well. Um, I haven't quite figured that out yet, so sorry. All right, but this gives us a picture, right? Dealing with um, dealing with Holy Week, that we're covering a lot of stuff during Holy Week. Now, one of the things that I am I'm, I'm hopefully going to get it out today. Um, I'm going to do a video on this. Um, is it's called a harmony of the passion. Or, or the passion drawn from all four Gospels. And, and this one starts with Monday, Thursday. So it runs Thursday, Friday, uh, and basically into, um, into the beginning of the Sabbath on Friday evening. Uh, and what it is is it takes all the material from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it merges it together into a single narrative. So you get all of the details. Um, it's pretty cool to hear the whole thing put together. I'm going to try and get that out today, a video of the, the audio of that, along with maybe some, some pictures that go along. Uh, and this is going to correspond with something that I'm going to put out throughout Holy Week. Um, traditionally, Holy Monday you read the Passion according to Matthew. Tuesday, you read Mark. Wednesday, you read Luke. And then Friday, you read John so that you've got all of them in the space of five days and you get you let them stand on their own. But if you've heard all of it first, it, it's really interesting because you, you, you realize the distinctiveness of the others, even more so than, than you normally would, right? Um, and, th and that, that actually gets, gets even more interesting. So if you look at where Thursday shows up in these, just as a, a quick 
glance. Thursday shows up. Matthew is chapter 26. Mark is 14. Luke is 22. And John is 13. So John spends... <laughs> this is why John is awesome. Uh, hopefully, if you have this down, I'm going to erase it. If not, you can rewind and pause. So this is really cool. Monday, Thursday through Good Friday. John's account of Monday, Thursday starts at chapter 13. And it runs uh, through 19, through the end of 19. 32, I believe. No, 42. Thirteen one through nineteen forty two. So a full a full six chapters. Right? Six? Seven. Sorry, I can't do math. A full seven chapters of John's Gospel cover two days of real time. Seven of the seven of the twenty-one. So I I, I uh, goofed up earlier. Um, eight eight total chapters for Holy Week for for John. Um, eight of twenty-one. Seven of the eight are Monday, Thursday on. <laughs> if you were ever wondering what the most important thing is in John's writing, this is all you need to figure that out. When you devote one-third of the gospel to two days of time, that's, that's where to look, that section from 13 to 19. Um, and, and like I said, we don't, we don't catch this usually, right? That, that this, there's so much going on in here. Um, So yeah, but today is Palm Sunday. So um, here, here's what we're gonna do. Uh, I'm gonna read through the um, the Palm Sunday texts and kind of just we're gonna look at all four of them just very briefly. Uh, but but I think this is good to hear all four kind of side by side by side and and note some of the differences and emphases of them uh so let's uh let's start with this um the triumphal entry is going to be 21 1 through 11 in matthew mark is going to be 11 1 through 10 Uh, Luke, John, Luke is going to be 19, 20, 1944, and John's going to be 12, 12 through 19.
Hopefully you can read those. I guess I could. I got all this whiteboard space, I could write bigger, I guess. All right, Matthew first. Matthew 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Okay, so that's Matthew. Um... Questions do we want to ask about this? Well, uh, there are two Old Testament things that show up in here. Maybe we'll start making a, a chart of these. Old Testament stuff. What Old Testament stuff is in there? There's two of them, like I said. And I mentioned it at the beginning of the video, so here's checking to see who was paying attention at the beginning of the video. And yes, I'm shaking my finger at you. By the way, if I, I don't remember if I actually said it or not. Uh, you should have a Bible and just kind of follow along with these. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, as we, as we look at them. Because you'll be able to look at the text and kind of see what I'm pointing out. What you might do is just put a scrap piece of paper in as we go so that we can kind of turn back and forth. I, I have my mind set up with... Uh, sticky notes so that I can flip pretty quickly between them. Nothing? Nothing? Nobody's got anything? Old Testament prophecies and stuff that are going on in here? The Psalms, yep, one Psalm in particular, and Zechariah. So you're on the right track with the prophets. Uh, so you've got Zechariah 9, specifically 9, yeah, man, this is a rough day for writing. 9-9, nine, nine, and Psalm 118, uh, specifically what they're referencing here um, is, let me just forget the actual, 
passage. Um, Twenty six. So this is the um, uh, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is straight out of Psalm 118, um, 25 and 26, sorry. Uh, it's two verses of this psalm. We read um, part of this psalm today. Uh, it's, it's the appointed introit for, for um, Palm Sunday. Uh, let's see, what else do we want to... Oh, um, animal. Let's see if we can try and keep track of this stuff a little bit. What do we have as far as an animal in here? In Matthew. Crowds. Disciples. One donkey? Or more than one donkey? Yeah, a donkey and a colt, right? A donkey tied and a colt with her. So we have a donkey. And a colt. Um, the crowds, uh, the, the crowds say, say two things, right? Um, they say, um, Hosanna, etc., and this is the prophet. Right. Um, they've also got the, the palm branches and they lay the, the cloaks down and that sort of stuff. Um, and then the disciples, um, they to go to go and get the animal. You've got the instructions to them. And they are the first to lay their cloaks on the animal. Okay. So that's going on in Matthew. Now, let's flip over to Mark. Mark chapter 11, starting at the first verse. Um, and we're going to kind of keep with this. And if you if you see other things that are differences in here, uh, write them in the comments. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Because there are a number, even though there's similarities, there are a number of, of differences that are, that are showing up in these. Um, We'll talk about the, the, the reason for the differences in a second. So Mark 11. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, 
what are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So, now what's going on here? Uh, what, do we, what do we have as far as the Old Testament in this one? Uh, what do we have as far as... So let's think about these. Uh, Old Testament, animal, crowds, disciples, any other differences uh, or, or distinctions that that is unique to Mark, at least so far. This is so weird seeing like the, the replay. It's like a, a couple seconds behind. Yeah, there's only the colt. And Mark says something about the colt that Matthew doesn't mention. What else do we get? What does he say about the cold? What do we got for Old Testament? What do we got for uh, disciples and crowd and, and other stuff? No one's ever ridden. Which is an oddly specific detail, right? What are we missing in the Old Testament that, so, so Mark's interesting because he omits one Old Testament thing and he expands on the other. have to figure out a way to try and get this to be more live. I'm not sure how to do that. Because I feel like there's a delay between what I'm saying and what you guys are hearing and then a delay from you guys typing to getting to me and that's just making this big gap. It's kind of annoying. So uh, write this stuff as you as you think of it. We're going to do this for all of them. So just be ready. Be ready for that. Okay. Uh, so there's no Zechariah. 
you still have Psalm 118, and you add uh, the coming kingdom. Uh, here they're still crying Hosanna. Uh, but there's nothing about the prophet, right? Uh, double check something. So they spread the branches and cloaks out, right? Yeah. Um, so the problem with with Zoom um, is you've got the lag for one. Not everybody can get on it very easily when we've tried to do this with meetings. Um, I can't record the video for. Um, others to watch later unless I do it through a third party software that just uh, really lags the, the computer. Um, it ends up being a lot, a lot more steps to try and get the stuff done and it doesn't always work well, uh, especially for, for interaction. Only those who are on Zoom are able to um, get to it, right? You have to have a, a mic and everything, everybody's internet's got to be working well to get the uh, video across. It's just, I think for this, it might be more trouble than it's worth as, as much as I would love it to work. Um, and same with the, the other things, you've got to have the, the accounts. And for Zoom, um, you have to have a, a paid account in order to do the larger groups for any amount of time. All right. Anyway, let's keep going because we're going to run out of time. I don't want to go forever. Uh, so the disciples are instructed again to go. Uh, you get the instructions. Um, they lay their cloaks. And then you have this added thing at the very end of it, right? Um, that uh, Jesus looks around at the temple. And then he goes back to Bethany, right? So that's Mark. Way we can see this a little bit. I might try and just pull this a little bit closer. Maybe that'll help some. It gives you most of the whiteboard at least. All right, Luke. Uh, Luke 19, starting at verse 29. When he had said these things, so Jesus just been telling a bunch of parables. When he had said these things, these parables, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. We're going to add that right now before I forget. Up. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. 
And they brought it to Jesus, and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear down the ground, you and your children with you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now it's starting to get a little bit different, isn't it? So we still have Psalm, we don't have Zechariah. We still have Psalm 118, right? Um, no Hosanna. Um, but you also get the the glory in the highest, which ought to sound pretty familiar to us from Luke, because that's what the angels said at his birth. <laughs> um, there's a parallel between these, right? Uh, so this is going to be Luke 2. Right? The animal, again, it's a colt. No one sat on. And we find out that it's the owners of the colt, not just random group of people that are sitting there watching the disciples do this. Right? It's actually the colt's owners. Um, The crowds, um, they say, blessed is the king. Um, you have the Pharisees, let's see, the disciples saying to go. You have the instructions. Uh, they lay the cloaks. Um, there's no palms. In Luke, uh, you also have, um, how do we say this? The, um, Uh, that they're there because of the miracles, uh, that are the mighty works. Then you've got the Pharisees. And the stones and the Lament over Jerusalem. Yeah. So, um, 
The Pharisees, like Kathy said, the Pharisees say, uh, tell your disciples to be quiet. Now, the reason for this is because they're confessing Jesus to be the Lord, right? And Jesus' point is, look, I'm the Lord. I created all things. So creation is going to cry out in praise of what's happening here, whether it's the disciples or whether it's the stones that I created. That's kind of his point. And then he's got the lament over Jerusalem. This is a prophecy of, I don't know if you can see that or not, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, August 10th, 70 AD is the destruction of Jerusalem, um, where the, the Romans come in and just obliterate it. Um, you know, maybe I'll, I'll try and pull up a, a copy of Josephus's account of this and maybe post it online. Um, and, and Jesus says, uh, basically, the, the reason why this happens is because um, you, don't, you don't know the time of your visitation, namely, you don't know who it is that's actually coming in right now. Right? Then we get John. And John is where it just, it goes in a very different direction. The next day, so this is John 12, the next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. It's just, it's so different. Um, you have Zechariah 9. You have Psalm 118. Um, and now the king of Israel. Um, the animal is a colt that says Jesus found it. Just an interesting little note. Um, the crowds, Hosanna. Uh, palm branches, no cloaks. The disciples don't understand. There's no instruction. The crowds are there. Uh, because of Lazarus, um, what else we got in here? Look, the world's gone after him. Uh, 
And then, I'm going to put this in a different color because maybe this is one of the most important little details. And it's in reference to uh, the disciples not understanding, but it's his the glory of Jesus. Now, this is important. In John, when John talks about the glory of Jesus, when he talks about Jesus coming into his glory, when he talks about Jesus being glorified, he's talking about one thing and one thing in particular, and that is Jesus's death, his uh, being nailed to a cross. That, in John's gospel, is the glory of Jesus. Okay, that's really, really important. Uh, Jesus has no glory as the Savior apart from the act of saving. Okay, that, that's how to think about this. Um, and the disciples don't understand this. They don't understand what's going on until after the glorification, after the crucifixion. Then now everything's making sense. Okay. But so this gives us a, a, a good picture then of what's going on. You've got, um, so like in John, you still got Zechariah and Matthew's got Zechariah. They all have Psalm 118, which should tell us something about Psalm 118. We'll read it here in a second, then we're gonna, and then we're gonna close. Um, Matthew's the only one that mentions both donkey, both the donkey and the colt. Most of them have Hosanna, um, but not Luke. Um, by the way, I'll ask this, it'll give you some time to, to answer. What does Hosanna mean? Why is that a, uh, a shocking thing for the crowds to say to Jesus, Hosanna? What is that? What does the word Hosanna mean? Um, you've got the instructions. These are basically the same across Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John just goes in a completely different direction because John is usually talking more um, theologically what's happening with this stuff. Why and what is, is happening, but especially the why, right? Um, and then you've got um, Mark, in Mark, uh, Jesus looks around at the temple and then goes, yeah, save us now. Good job. So, uh, so they're crying out, save us now, Lord. <laughs> well, if you're a Jew, you don't cry for salvation to anybody except for God. Right? So this is a big deal. Um, Jesus looks at the temple and then he goes back. Um, uh, he, here he goes up to Jerusalem. You have to lament over Jerusalem, the stones. And then the Pharisees here, they say the world's gone after him. Uh, uh, just a reminder, I don't know if we've talked about this before, but a reminder that from Jerusalem to Bethany and Bethphage is only a few miles. It's not very far. So Jesus is actually going back and forth just about every day of this week. Um, he's walking back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem. There, It, it would be like, uh, walking from, uh, oh, let's say, I'm trying to think of two two points that people would know well. It it, it would be maybe like walking, and it, it might not even be this far, walking from St. Paul's and Fairview to Emmanuel. Right, it, it's not very far away. Okay, um, it's pro probably about that about that distance to give you an idea of how close these are to each other. And you just got a valley that you go through. You've got the the Kidron Valley, and on so you've got the you've got the temple. You go down. Here's the Kidron Valley. Here's the Mount of Olives on this side. 
um, and the garden at Gethsemane. Okay, and then you go over a little bit further and there's uh, Bethany and Bethphage. Now, Psalm 118 is maybe one of the most important Psalms. And you'll notice, I'm just going to read this and notice how often parts of this Psalm come up, either in our liturgy or in various texts that we read. Even right from the very beginning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I'd cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of right. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So that's the psalm, and we should remember um, that this is it was called a Hallel psalm. It's a psalm of praise. This is a psalm of the temple that people would have sang as they're walking up into Jerusalem. They're singing the whole psalm, right? So put that in the context of Palm Sunday, that in very, very likely they're actually singing the whole psalm, right? Which definitely puts a whole new twist on this, on, on the amount of confession of who Christ is here. So hopefully that is a little helpful um, on the, the overview of Palm Sunday from all, all these different texts, right? Uh, big picture on this as well as the, the big picture of where this sits in the Gospels as, as kind of primary, especially Holy Week as we go through this. Um, like I said, I am hoping today to get out the, the audio of the um, Passion reading, so do, so do kind of watch for that later on. Um, and then during Holy Week, uh, there's going to be a few things that I'm going to be uh, doing services of that we don't normally have, but it's good opportunity since we're recording them um, to put them out. Uh, we're going to do uh, I'm going to do Holy Monday with the Passion from Matthew, Holy Tuesday with the Passion of Luke of uh, Mark, Holy Wednesday with the Passion of Luke. Uh, Monday, Thursday will be our normal service. Good Friday will have our normal service, but we will also have at least maybe one other, but definitely I, I'm going to do a what's called a Traore service, um, which is going to be a meditation on the seven words of Christ from the cross. And then um, on Holy Saturday, we'll have a, a, a Holy, Holy Saturday morning, which is um, Christ's descent from the cross um, is, is being taken down by Joseph Arimathea. Um, the Easter Vigil, uh, which is in the evening, um, Easter sunrise, and then we'll have our regular Easter day service, and then Easter Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Um, those will be the resurrection accounts from Mark, Luke, and John on those days. 
so so be on the lookout for those. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun to go through these and kind of show you guys what these look like, these services that we haven't had before, but are very much in the history of the church. Um, so if you've got any question on those, let me know. Um, again, hopefully this was helpful. I'm sorry we went a little bit longer than I had intended. I think that's all right, though. Um, and, uh, oh, while I've got you here, I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple minutes for this. I, I posed this. There's a few of you listening. I got a few responses. Um, starting next week on Sunday, I would like to start just working through a book of the Bible, uh, kind of your, your traditional book-based Bible, st Bible study. And I would like um, to know what book you all would like to cover. I've had, I think, three people respond with a book. I know Steve responded with the, um, uh, the, the Sunday lessons, but I would really like to do just a work through a book of the Bible because I don't know when the last time was that we really did that as a, as a church. Um, uh, so I've, I have a few people that, that have given me some, some thoughts, but I would like some thoughts from those that are listening right now. Uh, if you're listening later after this is live, do please comment as well what, uh, what book of the Bible you would like to cover. I will tell you, the if you didn't see the announcement, uh, starting on the 15th, the Wednesday after Easter, myself and some other pastors are going to continue doing Pastor Roundtable. Uh, right now it's looking like it's going to be five of us total. There was only three last time. Uh, Pastor Welmer and Vassar is going to join us, and possibly Pastor Ross from uh, Colorado is going to join us as well. Uh, and we're going to record that and uh, put that out on Wednesdays, and we're going to be walking through the book of Hebrews there. Uh, so don't pick book of Hebrews uh, for our Sundays, but do let me know what you would like to cover uh, for, for Sunday. So I'll give you a couple. I wonder if I can make a poll. No, I have to get choices. I don't want to give choices. Let's try this. What book do you want to study on? Let's see what that does. I didn't do what I wanted it to do. Oh, well. Philippians, Revelation. I want to know. That's fine. I want to know what the fascination is with the book of Revelation. I really do. It just seems strange to me because I think every time I've done this with any Bible study, wherever I've been, and I've asked, what book do you want to study next? It's always the book of Revelation. And I'm fine with that. We can do that. I don't know when the last time that was covered here. Um, and it hasn't been covered with me, so I don't know what was said. And I think that most people get it wrong. So I, I like the opportunity to show what's, what's correct about it. But I am curious if you have an answer for that. What is the fascination with the book of Revelation? 
And I'll tell you now, I'll bring this up if we, it, it, I'm guessing we'll probably do it because that's been the prevailing uh, choice. Uh, I will tell you right now, it is revelation singular, not revelations plural. Don't do that. I'll tell you guys why in the, in the study starting next week. But um, it's, uh, it's a weird thing. Because it is the end and what to look, what is coming. I'm going to correct that. <laughs> um, th this, is, uh, this is one of the um, misunderstandings with the book of Re Revelation. I wonder if maybe this is why people are fascinated with it. The book of Revelation, we're going to see this. Um, it's not telling us what to look for. Uh, in the in the end days, um, <laughs> uh, it's telling us about Jesus. So the very opening line, uh, "Ho apocalypse Jesu Christu," the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It's the opening line. That's what the whole thing is about. Uh, and in the midst of what looks like the world going to hell in a handbasket, to use that phrase, in the midst of that, that you, you have the assurance that the Lord still sits upon the throne and governs all things, that the lamb has still been sacrificed for us and his blood still covers us. Uh, that the Holy Spirit still comes with his gifts, all these things. And so it's this movement back and forth, um, looking at the world, everything's going crazy. You look up into the heavenly places and God's still in control of everything, right? Um, and, and it is where it gets difficult, and we'll, we'll get into this. This is probably what we're going to do. Um, is that it uses a lot of allegorical language, what is called apocalyptic language. Um, and so there's this tendency to try and take some of the things very literally in there, and you can't do that. Um, so, for example, if we if we want to take things literally, then you know, what do we do with Jesus being depicted? as a, a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes, right? Well, that's not what Jesus looks like. We know that very clearly. That's not what Jesus looks like. He looks like a man, right? Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get into this. Well, that's, that's probably what we're gonna, what we're gonna do. Um, And, the, and I would say this, that, that because the book of Revelation is about this and not about like the, the signs to try and decipher for the, for the end times, um, remembering that Jesus says very clearly, nobody knows the day or the hour. So it'd be very strange for Jesus to say, nobody knows the day or the hour. Be ready for, um, for the Son of Man will come like a thief in the night, uh, then to give us an entire book of things to look for. <laughs> right? It seems counterintuitive, right? Um, what, what's really nice is that one, once you kind of realize this is not what it's about, this is about Jesus uh, and who he continues to be even in the midst of turmoil, uh, it becomes just a really wonderful and comforting book. I think for a lot of people, it's scary. The Horns and the Beast, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to that in there, definitely. Um, so we'll start that on Sunday. We'll start working through the book of Revelation. Um, Sunday services will be at 10 o'clock every Sunday. Bible study will be at one. So that gives you time to go and eat lunch or whatever you need to do. And then we will get together at one and we'll go and I will do my best to keep it at an hour. So I know this has been running late, but I, uh, um, uh, I wanted to get the 
the thoughts of people on this. So we'll close with that. Um, you have a wonderful and blessed day and uh, be on the lookout for all the various things coming out uh, later today and this week. And um, we'll see you uh, throughout those. And if you've got questions or comments or whatever, um, you can always send me a, a message or, or call me or whatever, and uh, we can talk about this. So that having been said, uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for commenting. We will see you uh, next time.